Movie Buff Specialist Phil and John are back, continuing to count down our top 100 movies of all time. And for those of you who are tuning in now, who might be tuning into a movie podcast and being very confused, we'll just say this off the top. Alex is a little delayed, so we're going to be doing this podcast first, followed by the Survivor one. Now, if you're listening to this at another time that has nothing to do with this, you're going to be like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? If you're just a movie fan of ours, then you're really going to be confused. But the Survivor podcast is coming at like 10.05, so we're just we're just a little bit delayed. I wanted to get this one out of the way so that I don't keep myself up all night. And hey, we're going to get the most viewers we've ever had in the history of this podcast, John, because we have the lead in of Survivor. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. We're on to our number 57s. We actually are talking about two movies that appear in our top 100 the first time in a couple of weeks because uh, John had a couple of, move, couple of my movies a little bit higher on his list. This week, we got Cabin in the Woods from 2011 and we have Waves from 2019. And uh, we're definitely going to be starting with Waves because Cabin in the Woods at the time was all the rage, even though I think it's fallen off a little bit. Um, but Waves 2019, relatively unseen A24 movie. Uh, I don't know like what the official box office on it is, but it's very, very, very hard to figure out or to, to talk to somebody and have them say, yeah, I've seen Waves before. And John, you were not one of those people. I wasn't. And I remember leading up to its release in 2019, I had seen a couple of trailers for it and I was really intrigued by it. But 2019 was that transition year where I was moving back to society from the middle of nowhere. So it was one that just kind of like fell to the wayside and I kind of forgot about it until Phil mentioned it on his top 100. And I was like, I should probably wait until we get to the point where we're discussing it to actually watch it. Though. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And, and so this movie I, I, I agree with your assumption to just wait because this movie is brutal. It's absolutely mm -hmm. devastating and so incredibly hard to watch. So what I'm agreeing with is you waiting to watch it until now, because I don't know if you would actually want to watch that twice in a short period of time. Saw this in 2019, uh, very much like you saw a trailer for it. I'm going to be honest. I wasn't totally sold. It seemed like a really artsy movie. Um, a little over the top. We were also in this time and, and we see it with the best intention sometimes. And other times we see it as people trying to make money or get, you know, society points, mm -hmm. but it seemed like, okay, what kind of movie are we about to get here? It's about a black family. The trailer really isn't telling anything about what's going to happen in this movie. And so I was like, okay, like if that gets nominated for Oscars, I'll go see it. But at the same point, some of the movies that have been nominated years prior, I absolutely hated, like Black Panther. Mm -hmm. and I was like, is this kind of like the new, is this becoming like the new Oscar bait? Saying this as positively as I can, but that was my concern, is that this was going to become like, you know, the Oscar baity type thing where it was like, because of the times, whatever. This movie ends up garnering exactly zero Oscar nominations, and I think it is such a crime. Um, I went and saw this movie. It was really one of the only ones playing. And I remember sitting there and I'm watching the movie and like the opening just caught me right away. The music, the fast pace, the quick camera movements, Kelvin Harrison Jr. is phenomenal. Everything just captured me. And as soon as we got that one thing go wrong, I was like, ah, oh, shit. Like that's why it's called waves because it's just the ripple effect of every little thing and what it's going to do. The greatest decision that Trey Edward Schultz could have made is that at the halfway point of this movie, he does decide to completely shift and go a different direction because I could not watch another hour like the first hour of this movie, even though I will say that I think the first hour of this movie is one of the best downfalls ever put on film. It is devastating. It is brutal. And what Schultz does, what Harrison does, and what Sterling K. Brown does in an absolutely incredible performance that got almost zero credit, your guess is as good as mine, is they make you feel they make you realize that this is actually a good kid who is having something go on with him that he doesn't understand. And he doesn't know how to deal with it. He's too immature. And what happens when that keeps spiraling out of control and there's nobody there to stop the spiral. And this movie goes there. I always say that with movies like the, the classics, the graduate things like everybody thinks about every guy and hell, every woman is thinking about when they get out of school, who's the hot person, the hot, you know, parent who we yeah. always thought was hot growing up. And now all of a sudden we're drinking together and all of that. But the graduate goes there. A lot of movies don't go there. The graduate goes there. Waves is one of those movies that says, okay, we're not going to stop when one thing starts to go wrong. We're just going to keep going because a lot of times this is what happens. 
And and to me, this movie feels almost like a little bit of a um, like a, like a, a statement towards media. We never get anything about the media in this movie, but mm-hmm. we see somebody completely fall apart. And how would this have been covered in American media? And I know John, you're in Canada, but I'm sure you laugh at American media all the time. If this was covered by American media, how would this be covered? Do you know what I mean? And instead of giving that that BS gone girl type stuff, it just says this is who the person is. This is what happened. And now this is his family trying to deal with it. All the innocent people who wish they could have done something to stop it. It's just a brutal movie. And I will say after the first time I watched it, I said, well, never watching that again. But it's one of the best movies I've ever seen. John made me sit down and watch it because of this podcast. And I got to say, like. I, I thought that I had overrated the crap out of this just because of how hard it made me feel. Mm-hmm. I, I still think I underrated it. Like, I really do. Like, I am saying yeah. confidently that out of the 40, I guess we're on episode 44, out of the 44 movies we have talked about on this podcast, this is without a doubt my favorite one out of all 44. It's not even close. Like, it, like it really isn't close. This one just catapults. Um, but anyway, John, I just went on a four minute tangent, but I had to get, I've been, been waiting to get that off my chest since I sat down and watched this movie in 2019 and tried to convince people to sit down and mm-hmm. watch the damn thing. Yeah. I mean, it is a very powerful movie and just the feeling that Charles Gap captures in the movie of like that idea of like the building tension throughout the first hour of this movie, you just are waiting for the shoe to drop. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's coming and you're just waiting as everything thing builds momentum like a wave moving in mm-hmm. towards the shore and then it finally hits and then it fall like starts receding back and you get the back half. it's just such a beautiful film because of that i mean i was in right from the very beginning i mean you start a movie with some animal collective i'm right I, yeah i'm all for it and then when you end it with radiohead afterwards like oof. I, well and that's the thing like i think the music choices in this movie were incredible because he's doing this kind of indie, like, what the hell is this kind of music? And I know that, like, I don't know. I know Trey Edward Schultz is a white guy who directed and wrote this movie. So I know that there were, uh, trust me, some of the criticisms at the time were so ridiculous. Oh, this is what yeah. a white person would, it was like, what What are we talking, like, does that take away from how you viewed this movie? Like, I always hate, like, just how did you feel when you watched the movie? How did you feel? And I know that some of the complaints were like, he's putting in this music and blah, blah, blah. But I love that. He's got he's got Animal Collective. He's got Radiohead, and then he's got Frank Orange. He's got um, um, Kendrick Lamar. Like he's going around the entire spectrum of music. Because let's be honest, at the end of the day, everybody has different moods that they go through. And Jordan actually said he's half white and half black. I did not know that. But every oh, that even goes further with these critics, Jordan. Somebody <laughs> yeah. help me because critics are just becoming the most idiotic people. But. When, when I sit down and, and, and you see this, it's it's all of these different perspectives of who you are. I always think about this scene mm-hmm. where he's sitting there after they've broken up and he's listening to the really sad R&B song. Like, we all have, like, that's his breakup song. Animal Collective's Flory Dada is his upbeat song. We get later when um when his sister and Lucas Hedges, they're out there and we got Bluish playing, which is also Animal Collective. Like, it's these different versions of yourself. And I think that's also what this movie is trying to depict is – these different versions of these people, Sterling K. Brown, the different versions of him, the different versions of Car- Kelvin Harrison, the different versions of the mother, the different versions of this family, because the mother isn't actually their mother. And like what happened with them? Oh, she died of a heroin over like all these things. The sister who's kind of an outsider and then becomes something else. I think it's just it's capturing all of that in one of like in such a simple story. This is a this is a, you know, a Greek tragedy. Followed by an actual, like, can we forgive and what can we forgive? It's the age old question Mm -hmm. in human history. And this movie goes there with it. And one of my favorite lines from the movie is he's not a monster. He's not a bad person. He's a human being. And the way Sterling K. Brown delivers that line in that scene where he's talking to his daughter. And it's really the first time we see them interact in the entire movie. I mean, what I don't know. I mean, maybe people just don't know how to watch movies. I don't know where I don't know where the Oscar nom was. I have no idea. But it's it's just it's devastating. It's so it's so heartbreaking and it's so true. It's just we're all human beings. People say things that are stupid and they make mistakes. People say things they wish they never said. But so many times it's just how can we take this person down? How can we label them something to make sense of it? And this movie saying you can't label people. You can't just put somebody in a corner. Yeah, Kelvin Harrison's character is a murderer. That is something that happened, but we see the downfall of this character. We see what actually took place. 
we see that he wasn't a monster during the entire relationship and, but it still happened, but that doesn't, you can't just label based on one thing. And I don't know. I think this movie is an incredibly powerful movie. Yeah, it definitely is. And you, I can kind of understand why it didn't get a lot of Oscar glances in this year. This was a pretty big year in recent cinema. 2019 so i so i kind of understand why it might not have gotten it especially after like the whole moonlight thing a couple years before where people were upset about that Mm -hmm. but it's completely blown out of the water when you actually watch this movie because the movie is so well done i mean you keep mentioning sterling k brown and his performance as this so well-intentioned father but completely overbearing and Mm -hmm. It just adds to this whole idea of consequence that the entire movie is investigating because everything is just about responses to things and the consequences of one's actions and then coming around to how you deal with those consequences. Because if you don't, they just continue building and building until we Mm -hmm. do get that breaking point like we do when Tyler kills his girlfriend by accident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, I mean, because also it's like he doesn't, Sterling K. Brown doesn't want to deal with it. Sterling K. Brown doesn't mm-hmm. know how to deal with it. He doesn't know where to go with it. He doesn't know where to put it because he himself is going through a lot of difficult things and like all of these, all of these difficulties that he's had going through his life. Like he's struggling with all of that too. And he doesn't know where to compartmentalize it either. He needs help. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another thing with this movie is everybody just needs help. No matter how bad, how good, whatever it is. Everyone needs help at some point, at one point or another. We see that with Lucas Hedges and um, and the sister, whose name I completely forget. I don't know why I'm completely drawing a blank on it, but we see it with them because it's it's them coming together at a time where she needs it, and then her being there for him at a time when he needs it, when his father's dying mm-hmm. and he doesn't know how to deal with this because he doesn't like his father. And what does he do? It's it's just it's carrying. It's 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 under it's taking on such heavy, heavy, heavy themes. And, and I don't feel like, yeah, obviously this story is just completely piling on as the movie goes on. How can we make it worse, 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 at least for the first half. But I didn't feel like I was being manipulated throughout this movie. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of movies in these, uh, you know, late 20 teens, even in the early 20 teens, really the whole last decade of film, I feel like there's a lot of movies who try to manipulate you so hard by just throwing out like little like buzzwords or buzz phrases or whatever's going on at the time. And I'm sure movies back in the 50s, 60s, 70s did that too, but we weren't alive for that. So we don't really know. Um, but, but a lot of these movies, they're not using something as profound as Attica from dog day afternoon. Like they're just not. And so when I think about like how this movie handles it, it doesn't have to go for cheap. You understand what everybody's going through because of the dialogue, because of the interactions, because it all just feels so unbelievably authentic. If you were a, a, a high school wrestler who felt like they had it all and your shoulder is so messed up that you're going to lose your season, that feels like the end of the world when you're in high school. It just does. Mm-hmm. And then when you when your shoulder is so done and you think, hey, I'm going to be I'm going to lose out on this. I might never wrestle again. And then you start taking painkillers just so you can keep going. This is something that would happen like this is real. And I think that's what I love so much about this movie. There's no manipulation. It just happens because it just happens. Yeah, everything that happens seems like a logical response to a situation. It's not It's not like anything's blown out of proportion or anything like that. It's every single event we see in the movie makes sense based on the actions taken prior to it. Mm-hmm. And the fact that Schultz is able to do this protagonist swap halfway through the movie and make it feel completely natural Mm -hmm. and not feel like a completely different movie is absolutely incredible because even everything that Emily experiences and all of her like isolation, she feels from the fact that everyone is ragging on her about her brother Mm -hmm. and the fact that she feels guilty that she didn't stop him because she felt she had the opportunity to, And it still just all goes back. And everything is so meticulously set up throughout the film that in these opening scenes where we see, you know, we we know that Tyler has an injury and he's Mm -hmm. been nursing it and we know something there. And 
you're just waiting for the injury to get so bad so that he can't do it, especially after the doctor tells him, you participated one more match, you're done for good. Yep. And it's just like, okay, so we know he's going to do that. What happens after that, though? And I, I didn't go into the movie knowing a lot of what the plot was. All I mm -hmm. had was like this, like, what the little like two sentence synopsis on IMDb, which is, uh, you know, suburban black family uh, deals uh, with the pain of a loss. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what's this loss? And it's like, oh, Whatever it's his wrestling means. career. And then it's like, yep. oh, is it him? Because you, you get that point where he's very angry and emotional. And he's driving around a lot. And you're like, hmm, this is a lot of driving mm -hmm. to have happen. Is, is he going to get in a car accident? Is he going to die? And then when you finally get to the point where he actually kills his girlfriend, you're just like, oh, it's that type of loss. Because it's almost a harder loss at that point than him dying. Because now it's like, now there's this consequence and the the stigma attached with having a murderer in the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after after clearly we've seen the father have to go through so much in his life to get to where he is with the big house and the good family and all that. And like we we see all of that. And and also we see this kid as like a fun, loving, having a good time kid who who just wants to continue. Like he seems like he really loves life. And then he just it's that trickle down. And, and the thing is, like Schultz could have easily just decided, OK, we're going to have him like drink and get in a car. accident. Mm -hmm. He could have easily just had him die. Because essentially what this movie does in the second half, we don't see him one time until the very, very end when he's sitting in the yeah. jail cell. So as far as we're concerned, and, and it's kind of that like we have to move on because he is dead. He's in there for the next 30 years of his life. He's 18 right now. He's going to be 48 years old. We might not even be alive. And if we are, we're not going to recognize him. It's going to be a totally different person. And, and so to see him as that upbeat personality makes it all the more devastating. Because, you know, you always wonder how does somebody get to the point where they do murder or where they do, uh, you know, commit some sort of terrible act. How do they get to that point? And this movie does it in a way where it's like, this is actually a little too relatable because I like to think of myself as a good person. And how would I have dealt with that situation mm -hmm. at the time? And, and, and being a teenager, being in high school, that's where these things really can snowball out of control. That's when people are at their most vulnerable for the most part with suicide or with, with there's so many different things to pull you out alcohol drugs you know we see him you know all of a sudden he's he, she's pregnant and now he's gonna have to have a kid like all of these different things that are happening this is what you know this is why it's such an important setting to make it him and then you have the quieter sister who never did anything wrong her entire life all she did was be there for him in the bathroom floor which is all the more devastating of a scene mm -hmm. once we actually get to the end and know just how impactful that was and that that's one of the last memories she has of him um it's it's just crazy it's hard it's a hard watch it's just a very very hard watch it is and like you say i think a lot of that hard watch comes from how relatable it is because i think all of us who are past that age and are at the point where we really look back at ourselves back then and we realize we were not as great as we thought we were mm -hmm. and well, i was but... we just we just look at it and think what if I had made like that one mistake that put me down that path instead? And that's, that's the beauty of this film is that because of the way that Schultz escalates the situation throughout that first hour, it feels even more relatable because it's all these small decisions. It's never a massive decision mm -hmm. that results in this murder. Cause it's not a planned murder. No, it starts at the very beginning. It starts with him deciding to, wrestle despite the fact that his doctor advised against it yep and then it keeps snowballing from there over and over and over again and then we have his bad responses to the conversation about like abortion and everything and we then get to the point where he is texting and she breaks up with him and his response to that is to get ridiculously drunk decide mm -hmm. to drive while ridiculously drunk and then go to this party and confront her in a mindset he was nowhere in the right mindset to do that and mm -hmm. because of that we get these consequences it's it's incredible how schultz constructs the film just yeah. because it feels so real and, and and you said the bad reaction to the abortion and i just want to bring this up because 
that I feel like I feel like while it might not be the most um correct response to it, it feels like such a natural progression of the feelings of panic mm-hmm. into fuck you. And then the whole like the part where Kelvin Harris Jr. spits at her is yeah. I know that that was ad libbed. I know that that was like that was not written in the script. Like there's no way it was. And it's such a brilliant acting decision. And then immediately it's like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Get back in the car. Like, let's go. It's these, <clears throat> it's these teenage dramas, but it's actually around something massive. And that's what makes it different because we know that there actually is a now a unborn child involved. But these are those teenage dramas where every every teenage relationship has these moments of people just totally disrespecting each other. Because you're at that point where you don't understand quite empathy of these situations because you've never been in this situation before. You don't know what it feels like. You don't know what it's what it's all about. And so while it's not the reaction that we'd have now at 29, Mm -hmm. hopefully, um, it is one of those things where when you're 18, 17 years old, that's a terrifying situation. It's a terrifying situation. And, And and I think that it just it just escalates again so naturally. There's no force, there's no pushing. It just escalates naturally. I feel like these conversations are real conversations that people would have. I'm, I'm I don't know. Like I, I just, I struggle to find like, um, um, like where could he have improved some of these moments? Where was one thing that I was like, oh, I don't like. Like I, do, I don't have any of those with this movie. There's nothing where I'm like, oh, now we're at that part. It all just keeps going, and the, and the, the the decision to pretty much just spin the camera and to shift the aspect ratio, the entire Mm -hmm. movie in and out, depending on how claustrophobic he wanted you to feel. And when he's driving in that car, you're looking at pretty much like a third of a screen lit up in the middle of your TV. If you even notice, I never noticed that the first time I watched it, which was on the big screen in a movie theater. Mm -hmm. I think it was just so taken in by the movie. And then this time after he kills her, it was the first time I was like, wait a second. The movie wasn't always this claustrophobic. And then it just Mm -hmm. keeps bouncing back and forth unbelievable stylistic decisions that you know are adding to this this tension and this fear and this worry of like how do i get myself out of this situation because at that age you're not thinking about how do i solve the problem it's how do i get myself out of this bad situation so i can continue to move on with my life yeah exactly and the the spinning of the camera at first i was like oh this is kind of cool it gives us this like unique feel to the movie because the first like 10 minutes we just kind of get constant spinning the entire time mm-hmm. and then then you start realizing what Schultz is doing with it and how it's kind of like this dizzying effect which really puts you into Tyler's mm-hmm. uh, shoes and like this is how Tyler's feeling he's feeling very like dizzy by everything that's happening to him because not only is he dealing with a potentially life altering injury to himself but also mm-hmm. he's dealing with this life altering event that's completely separate from it. And it's, it's just so overwhelming. And that's really what Schultz is capturing with his camera work, which is a crazy concept when you think about it, but we've seen it so many times in fantastic movies and it's just what helps elevate them is that Schultz creates emotion and, it, and feeling through the use of camera and through aspect ratio in this film in a way few other filmmakers can yeah well and and it's it's about that pacing if you think about the music he's using it's very aggressive Mm -hmm. music in the first half in the second half Mm -hmm. slows down gets more melodic but in the first half it's aggressive music i mean animal collective people don't listen to animal collective if they're trying to go to sleep listen to animal collective at least unless you're listening to bluish which he does put in the second half which i think is but when you listen to florida da either you're trying to have a good time and get drunk or you're trying to piss off your parents because they would hate Mm -hmm. that song because it's obnoxious it's one of the best songs ever and it's so annoying but it's very aggressive um i can never think of the song the one with the uh the line about the 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 penis john i know you like to scream that word on this podcast but um all my life i got what it, what is the I don't know the song. I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm sounding like an idiot. I don't know what that, you're talking about. There's it's the song around the campfire where he's rapping the entire Oh song. yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. He wants he wants it to be as big as the Eiffel Tower, John. Right. Um and and so when when you're when you're at that point, it's just it's this aggression, this aggression. Like, mm-hmm. how do I take out my aggression all the time? And then to transfer to the second half where it's like the it it's an hour-long epilogue. Mm-hmm. which is so impressive 
because it's an hour long falling action of all these people. The mother who's not even his real birth mother going to visit him in prison because she feels that guilt. Sterling K. Brown having no idea what to do with it. And then the sister just trying to do anything she can to feel some sense of family, Mm -hmm. something it's like for a whole hour, he has a falling action. How do you do that after such an aggressive first hour? But I think those camera moments, all that, it all slows down so much in the mm-hmm. second act, in the second half, whatever you want to call it, slows down so much. That's so important. It, it, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how many directors could really pull off such a drastic change. We saw um, Derek Sianfranch try it. And Derek Sianfranch has a movie in my top 25, 26 with Blue Valentine. He tried it with, um, with the place beyond the pines. And personally, I think he fell on his face. I think the movie's good, but I think it tries too hard and I don't think it gets there. This movie though built, as soon as I saw the place beyond the pines, I said, that's not a very good movie, but that is a movie that is going to change the game for indie films. Mm -hmm. Waves is the perfect version of the place beyond the pines. And, and uh, that's, yeah, that's just a confident director. His, this was his third movie. He's 31 years old directing this movie, 31 years old. Think about that. There's not many great directors who are directing their third movie and making one this good at the age of 31 years old. No, it's it's really impressive. And it comes down to a lot of the things. His attention to detail in this movie is fascinating. I love just like seeing all the typos in the text messages. I love it. I love it. Because it, it, it's such a minor detail that people probably won't notice. But when you're paying really close attention and you notice that where... Even there's one where uh, Emily has the text and it has two correction text messages from her father Mm -hmm. correcting a spelling error. And that's the type of realism we don't get in films enough. Yeah. With texting, because especially that, like it made me feel good that he hits the O every time he wants to hit the I too. Because I do that every single Mm -hmm. time. My finger keeps slipping. And every time I want to hit the L or the M or the N, I hit backspace. And then it goes back and then I have to restart pretty much. And, you know, it's, it's just... Yeah, it's those are the types of things like how do you keep technology? How do you make a movie about Jesus Christ? How do you make a movie about um, teenagers nowadays where so much of the communication they're doing is through text, which isn't a visual, you know, film medium. It doesn't work well there and yet make it work. This is the way you do it with the music and you're you're over his shoulder. You're watching Mm -hmm. him doing it and you see everything he's saying wrong and everything he's doing wrong and everything she's doing that's wrong there's so many things being done wrong on both sides here and you're just you can feel that frustration building up what would you do if you're in that situation and you just found this out and now you have no control to talk about it or anything it's not easy no not at all but show spanish just to do it in a way that is feels so natural when you think about it it feels like the natural way of showing these things but people still struggle doing it yeah well, I, I, uh, I'm excited to see what Trey Edward Schultz is going to do with his career. He did Krishna, Krishna or Krishna. I forget exactly what it's called. And then he did, um, he did, he, it comes at night and then he did this. And I mean, he's, he's made nothing but good movies and I'm, you know, with how young he is, I'm excited to see if he kind of build himself into like a little bit of a PTA type thing. Cause PTA was also doing a lot of really good movies at a very, very young age. And, um, his are obviously more iconic now, but who knows? We could be looking back one day and saying, man, Waves really was kind of the magnolia of that, you know, where nobody yep. re- didn't really get the credit it deserved at the time, but maybe it will in the future. So that's what I got on that. Um, waves, go check it out if you want to be depressed because um, that's that's what it is. It's Especially depressing. if you're not from the States because hearing a judge sentence a 18-year-old to life in prison for the rest of their natural life in prison with no parole until 30 years is absurd for anyone that doesn't who's happen in not Canada. familiar. No, no. Our maximum sentence for a murder is 25 years for a first degree murder. Second degree for murder. First degree murder. First degree murder is a 25 year sentence. That's insane. And for a second degree murder like this, still tried as an adult at the age of 18, you're looking at, 10 to 25 years with parole being after 10. Interesting. Interesting. It puts a whole different perspective on the film, I feel. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who lives in the States, I was like, yeah, of course you got life in prison. Mm -hmm. They do the whole eye for an eye, life for a life thing down here. So, 
you know, go listen to the mercy seat by Nick Cave and the bad seeds. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Eye for nine, a tooth for a tooth. Okay. Well, that's interesting, John. Thanks for that. That also made me a lot more depressed. Thanks. Thanks for Sorry. that. Up. Also, the shot of, and, and this is the last thing, the shot of him eating two hot dogs with no buns, beans, and corn. Kill me. <laughs> it was brutal. <laughs> oh, my God. It just killed. It's like, why'd you have to set it up like that? Why'd you have to set it up like that? What's that? Why'd you have to tell me in the pool? Yeah, Shailene Woodley and the Descendants. Why'd you have to tell me in the pool? Like, why'd you have to do that to me, Trey? Why? All right, we're moving on. John, was the best movie you watched this week? So I can start talking about something that makes me a little bit happier. Well, I was getting a little worried until yesterday because I was going to have to say Inherent Vice, and I knew Phil would get on my back for it. I would. Um, I also saw you only gave it three stars, though, so that's okay. I would, I'd yeah. probably give that like two and a half. So Yeah. Uh, like fine PTA film. It felt really weird watching it after The Long Goodbye because you can really see the comparisons between those two same, movies. Same it's movie, the same Long Goodbye is better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Other than that, I watched uh, I watched the new Resident Evil movie, and like the Resident Evil movies, kind of have like this soft spot in me. I really love the Resident Evil games, and this one surprised me quite a bit. It felt they leaned more into like the horror genre than the action genre for the first half, and it felt more like a like a zombie outbreak mm-hmm. movie in the beginning. Uh, really impressed with it, but hands down, best movie I watched this week was The Power of the Dog. Mm. Uh, New Western uh, starring Benedict Cumberbatch, which I will admit I was quite apprehensive of seeing Benedict Cumberbatch playing someone in a Western, but Jesse Plemons and Kirsten Dunst were in it. So I was like, oh, I'm going to give this mm. a shot. And it far exceeded my expectations. It, it, I would say it is the best movie I have seen that was released this year so far. Nice. All right. Well, that's good. I haven't seen it yet. I plan on seeing it. Um, definitely want to check that one out. Um, Kirsten does and Jesse Plemons were great in Fargo season two. So, oh, so good. bring it, bring it back, baby. Yeah, yeah, no, Fargo season two is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I, I only got a little bit in season three, but season two is just like a masterpiece. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. For me, it was going to be the innocence. Um, so I'm actually doing a Harry Potter marathon right now. <laughs> uh, my fiance is massive into those movies. So we're halfway through. Um, I will say the first one is much better than I remember. I will say the third one is much worse than I remember. And I will say that the second one and the fourth one kind of do exactly what I remember them doing. Um, so yeah, that you could take that as you will. I'm not, I'm not very much a, uh, a Harry Potter person. So, you know, that just kind of is what it is. But, um, I was going to go with the innocence, which is the, is a horror movie that John actually had talked about at one point earlier mm-hmm. on in this podcast. Uh, involving kids uh cool cool spin on um uh what is it the screw uh the, yeah, the turning, turning of the screw. screw that's it uh so cool twist on that really creepy movie definitely something we're checking out mm-hmm. but i finally rewatched re- run lolo run for the first time in like 10 years 11 years 12 years i think it was in high school last time i saw it so probably 2009 Man, that is an adrenaline rush. Holy shit. It is such a fast-paced movie. It just keeps going. Yeah, it's a gigantic gimmick, but it kind of set the tone for these types of gigantic gimmick movies, and it just works. Like, it is just so much fun. Uh, uh, Franca Potemke, or however you say her name, I'm going to butcher that. Um, She is so fun to watch just run around like a psychopath this entire movie. Um, you're, you're just wondering, okay, what's going to end up happening in the last iteration of this story? Cause the way the movie works, it's just the same story three times. Uh, her try, like what all these, what ifs just incredible stylistic choices from Tom, however you say his last name, T Y K W E R such a fun movie. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. It was all the rage back in the late nineties, early two thousands. Mm-hmm. People loved it. They thought it was so much fun and then it kind of fell off. Um, and and doesn't get talked about nearly as much now that there's more um now that like international cinema is more accessible but this yeah. is definitely this was definitely like a gateway drug for a lot of people and uh it's just it's just a lot of fun so check that one out for sure all right john tell me about the cabin in the woods uh, speaking of movies that have kind of fallen off from the public eye um yeah. because the cabin in the woods was huge when it was released in 2011 and like this was a movie that had been sitting in the studio for three years at this point. It was filmed back in 2008, and it was kind of just waiting for the right opportunity. Uh, 2011 was that time because Joss Whedon was getting hyped up because of the Avengers, and what a what a wonderful surprise this movie is to the surprise of 
absolutely no one who has looked at my top 100. I absolutely love the Cabin in the Woods structure for a horror film. I have the first two Evil Deads on my list. I love the isolation in the woods. I have the Black Witch Project on my list. Like This is one of my favorite horror genres. And to see it so meticulously dissected the way that Drew Goddard does in this movie is, is so fascinating because it's absolutely incredible to take all of these horror movies that we have always seen and essentially boil it down to there is a secret organization that is trying to appease ancient gods so they don't rise and destroy the world. It, it's such a cool and unique concept that lets you investigate horror tropes in a way no other concept ever could. Yeah, I I will say um, so. I saw this movie probably about three or four times in theaters. I was all over this when it came out. Freshman year of college, I'm all mm -hmm. in. You know, uh, this was just this was just the time to see it. Um, came out perfect time in my life. Man, do Richard Jenkins and Bradley Whitford make this movie? Oh, yes. Holy shit! Like they they just lean in as hard as they can possibly lead in. Richard Jenkins is probably, and this is going to sound kind of crazy. He's one of the most dynamic actors that's ever been in Hollywood. And I think a lot of that, I always go back to this. A lot of times the not really very attractive actors who have never been attractive throughout their career. I'm not saying like as they got older, they just aged because that's every mm -hmm. human being. But like Richard Jenkins was never a heartthrob. Shocking, mm -hmm. but he was never a heartthrob. So he had to act to get his roles. You know what I mean? Like he had to really earn these things. I'm not saying that people who are very good looking didn't have to earn it, but it's a little bit easier in some instances. There's more roles for young, good looking people than there mm -hmm. are for balding middle-aged men with, with pock marks all over their face. And so him leaning into this and going all in on like taking the bets and doing it. And like, they're watching. And there's that one part where she's about to get killed on the bridge or whatever. And he just looks over. He's like, Hey, what are you doing? Like he is having so much fun with this movie. Bradley Whitford is a perfect person for him to bounce off of. The two of them are just enjoying themselves. And it's so much fun to watch these two old actors enjoy themselves on film in this movie where there's so much bad. Cause a lot of times a movie like Cabin in the Woods would struggle with how do we connect it all? How do we make everybody aware that it's a game and that it's something? And this movie does it great where it's like this is a corporation. They work these bullshit jobs that they don't feel like doing. You know, they hate their job just like anybody else in the world hates their job. They wear the suits and the, or the ties and they all dress the same. And they go around doing office pools on stuff. Just so happens that their job is to make sure these teenage people get murdered. And so like – their their interactions throughout the entire movie, the way they the way they talk to each other, just the way they ham it up, it makes the movie for me. I will also say that every time you mention Joss Whedon, I might accidentally let out a fart noise with my mouth. No, I that, do not that's like fine. Him. That's completely acceptable. Do not like him. This is Drew Goddard through and through, mm -hmm. and I think the proof of that is look at the rest of Drew Goddard's films and look how yes. good they are, and look at the rest of Joss Whedon's work and realize that it is all cult classics um, that aren't classics. They're just cult because people like Firefly for some nonsensical reason, which, John, I'm sure you like Firefly, but I'll move on from that. Um, and and Drew Goddard, I mean, his finger is just in this. I mean, he was all yeah. the rage, too, because he was coming off of Cloverfield. So that Cloverfield, also helps. Yeah. Yeah, he – and, I mean, Drew Goddard is phenomenal and does not direct enough because when he does, we do get these phenomenal films like this. And going back to Richard Jenkins and Bradley Whitford, the beauty of it is that these two <clears throat> people working this job feel like a normal, everyday heart, pair of partners working a job. Mm -hmm. It's never like they're, they're middle management. They, mm -hmm. they have to – run these things, but they still have to answer to the director and everything. They complain about other departments and them not doing what mm -hmm. they're supposed to be doing. It feels so natural. It's it feels so like normal. the conversation <laughs> we all have in our workplaces. Yep. And despite how absurd everything is that they're doing, it still feels normal. Mm -hmm. And that is something that if that wasn't done correctly, completely ruins this entire movie. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and who would think that they would go with that route with it to make it the mm -hmm. office pool so corporate? I mean, I was doing this literally today. Like this happened at yeah. my job today because I instigated it. But like 
you know, that whole thing of like complaining about the other, well, we always do our job. Once again, Cam not doing what they need to like, what, what, but that's, that's just how it is. Like, except what they're doing is literally going to save the world because otherwise, and, and to just, des- and to describe movies like, why do these teenage kids keep falling into the same trap? Well, because that's what the gods want. And who are the gods? The gods are the audience. The God is the audience mm-hmm. who just wants young, hot people running around, doing whatever the part where they're watching her get undressed like that's what the audience wants they want young Mm -hmm. hot people who stumble into something get killed off one by one in slasher style and this movie just leans how do they determine who it's going to be well we pull it's just random whatever object they pick up that's what it's going to be this movie i mean it's it's so fun kristen connelly is very good in this Mm -hmm. uh chris hemsworth's great uh frank kranz is he steals the show obviously yes. as the stoner i mean he's he's just so good the fool as they call him mm-hmm. in this but that scene where he saves her from the chainsaw guy by putting up yeah. his his coffee cup bong is just i mean i can still remember the movie theater everybody dying laughing when that happened and i was sitting there next to one of my very very stoner friends who would publicly admit that probably on a podcast because that's just the kind of guy he is and uh, he was laughing so hard, I thought we were going to have to carry him out of the movie theater. So, you know, it's just – it's one of those things. So, um, I, I just – it just nails it. It just nails mm-hmm. it. We talked about that with Waves. We're talking about that with this. It just nails it. it. It knows what it wants to be. It's not trying to be a groundbreaking movie. It's just trying to draw your attention to the absurdity of all of these horror movies and dive into these tropes and dive into what if there was this behind-the-scenes network – which is technically just writers of horror movies and producers of horror movies who are desperately trying to find the next Blair Witch or the next Paranormal Activity or the next Conjuring. Yeah, and that's the the fascinating thing about this is that I mean you've already made the comparable that the audience are the god the, the old ones and the gods and like, that's what who's trying to be pleased and it's really interesting when you consider the fact that Cabin in the Woods came out right as we kind of saw that shift in horror franchises too mm-hmm. and we saw that shift in the horror genre to this the, the new cer- more cerebral horror genre because we had seen all of these tropes and we having it all connected with this like shadow organization that's doing it all really it made you more aware of everything so we talked about it with scream and how scream knew what it was doing and how i mean west craven of course uh, being an originator of the slasher genre knew mm-hmm. how to play on it but what drew goddard does in this film is he takes Scream and takes it to the nth degree because it's we're so far in on it that mm-hmm. it's not even just knowing the tropes, it's seeing how the tropes come to be. Yeah. And that's the important thing with this film is that because we always are asking, why are they doing this? That's so dumb. People would never do that. And this movie's telling you, you're right, they wouldn't. We made them. Yeah, so we have pheromones coming out of the out of the ground, or we have uh, well, what do they do? Oh, we we have how do they make Chris Hemsworth stupid again? Where he's like, actually, this is all wrong. Let's split up. Like, how do they make him stupid again? Oh, they like missed him as he's going down through the hallway. Yeah, it's something. Like, it's like the same thing as with the pheromones. It's so much. It's so funny. Like it's just it's so over the top. But at the same time, like why do they split up in every horror movie? I don't know. And then to do it as the cabin in the woods. I mean. Obviously, this is very much leaning into, you know, the Evil Dead mm-hmm. franchise and, yes. you know, that John's into those. I mean, if you read the board in the background, it's like the evil raping tree or whatever the one thing is, which is what? From the Evil Dead 2? And one. We'll, we'll and talk one. about it okay. twice. Don't worry. Okay, great. Can't wait. <laughs> um, but, you know, like all of those, like all of those things that are on the board – They're all things that we see in movies. And I love how it's like, Mm -hmm. hey, I had zombie. How come I didn't win? It's like, well, no, these are inbred, demented zombies or whatever they say. And it's like, oh, how is that different? It's different. Okay, fine. And like the intern who's just getting ripped apart, like all these little things throughout. And then to have Sigourney Weaver be the Mm -hmm. one who comes in and explains the entire thing. Mm -hmm. It's just it's such a great decision. Drew Goddard really was the man. Drew Goddard is such a great writer. Um, again, I, I love to do this, John, and then, and then you can go, but Drew Goddard is everything Joss Whedon wishes he was. Um, he's clever. Mm -hmm. He's, he's fun. He's, he's intelligent. Joss Whedon just got to also throw his name on this. Congratulations. Um, I really, really, really dislike Joss Whedon. Don't Uh, worry. I do the exact same thing when it comes to JJ Abrams and Damon Lindelof. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I, I, it's fine. I I feel that. that. And Drew Goddard does do it because, and like you said, the Sigourney Weaver being the person to come out. And 
this was not the only movie in this time period where Sigourney Weaver turned out to be the head of this organization because she did it in Paul as well. Yeah, and yeah, that's, it was which just like such this a weird random, typecasting yeah. that Sigourney Weaver got at the time. But because we recognize Sigourney Weaver as this like iconic horror hero, having her be like this mastermind evil because she's not the bad guy in this movie mm -hmm. because we can under we as an audience can understand why this organization exists why this has to happen and when you're in that final sequence where uh, dana and marty are down there and like dana looks like she's about to kill marty you're kind of rooting for her to do it because you're like I don't really want the world to end right now. Yeah, I know. Am I going to die? Because kill him. Well, it's that whole one person to save humanity, right? Yeah, exactly. And But even then, you're still so much so satisfied when she doesn't kill him. Because it's just the way the characters phrase everything and the way they present the idea of, well, maybe if this is the way it's been done always, maybe it's time for someone else to, to be in charge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and they think, oh, maybe we can change it. And then instead, the gigantic hand just kills them all. Yes. Yeah. It would well, be nice if you had time to make it so that somebody else could be in charge. But instead, you're all actually dead. And and I love, though, that it goes there. Like, um, I love that it goes there with that, where it's like, hey, like, this is like, this is what needs to have like we need the blood of this person it needs to be in this order this is the only mm -hmm. way that they will be appeased the only way they'll be happy and then it's like well what if what if we just did it in a different order well if you did that then the whole world would end like it's it's yeah. so overly dramatic but it just works mm -hmm. and, and even the idea of like the virgin has to be the last one because it's the final girl concept right mm -hmm. and the fact that they even explain it it's like as long as the virgin's the last one, it doesn't matter. She can live, she can die. Yep, it's optional. We've done it. We we've hit exactly what's supposed to happen. And how the uh the whore has to be the first one to die. Mm -hmm. Right? Like it, it it's so clever the way they present it and they present the intricacies of the requirements for this ritual. Especially when you consider this is only the American specific ritual. Mm -hmm. because it's different in all these other countries that we get these like flashes to where other things are happening well yeah in japan it's the ghosts with the school children and in, in uh in what was the other one in in um was it uh, norway what is aries what is aries had, like the the ape creature yep yep yeah, I mean, it's it's fun that it's like, and all we need is one of them to succeed. We don't need all of them, mm -hmm. but, you know, Japan has 100%, and, like, that scene where they're all singing around it, and then she ends up getting turned into, oh, we killed her with love. Like, that it does tend to be a lot what happens in those movies. Mm -hmm. So that just that one just made me really, really, uh, really, really laugh. But, yeah, it's just, like, I do, I love that it's, it's diving into all of the different countries and what they view as horror. I mean, every, like so many Japanese movies, it really like horror movies. They really, it's just ghost stories. That's what they focus on. Yes. American ones are slasher uh, movies for the most part. Like all those different, like where does creature feature work? Where does that, it just, you know, it just works. Mm -hmm. And, and, and to have everybody else fail and like America's the last stronghold, this is who we need. And they think they've done it. And then that's, Oh shit. The fool. He's still alive. What do you mean he's still alive? Like, how do we kill him? We can't. You know, especially they, because they say, they say, oh no, one of them's still alive, and they don't tell you who it is, and he's really not the person you're expecting to show up there at the end. Yeah, you're thinking it's going to be the well. You know, it can't be. Well, th see, that's the problem, though. It can't be Chris Hemsworth mm -hmm. because he gets destroyed. The boyfriend or whoever it's supposed to be, he gets stabbed through the neck like 800 times. Yeah, and it could be the whore. She gets her throat slit, but I don't know. It kind of has to be the fool. The fool's always. It always seems like the fool and and the virgin are the last two left. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so it's also yeah. leaning into that trope of like the shock. Oh, he's still alive, and here we go. It, it's also really important that Marty's character kind of realizes the weirdness of everything going on. Mm -hmm. I think because he kind of acts as this audience surrogate to the entire situation, where. We can't personally be in the film, but through Marty, we kind of 
get to have this idea of why are you thinking that? And mm-hmm. even just him commenting, uh, like, when has Crims Hemsworth's character been like the big man on campus type? He's a sociology major on an academic scholarship. Yeah, this yep. isn't him at all. And again, like Drew Goddard prefaces this earlier on when he's literally giving a book to Dana, being like, Professor hasn't read this, doesn't lecture about this one. He'll think you're a genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, yeah. I we, know. we, he set up as this academic, and then he still kind of falls into this stereotypical horror trope of the jock. Which they need to do. And how do they do that? Well, okay, like, we, like, oh, we'll get the THC. We'll make the THC stronger. So that's why the stoner, or the <laughs> fool becomes even more foolish and nobody believes him and all that. And then with him, they have that. And what does he call They call her like the celebitard at one point, mm-hmm. which I had heard that phrase since I think 2011. <laughs> but like, why is she acting like this? They're just they, like, it's all these people pushing them to act in these trope ways which is just such a fun way to to handle that of like, they're not necessarily that way. Now the fool was always the fool, but they're not necessarily that way until we make them that way. And because it's Chris Hemsworth who ends up going on to be Thor, you're going to believe that, yeah, he would turn into this crazy jock person. And they do at least have him throw a football at one point where it's like, think mm-hmm. fast. And the guy catches it outside. So at least we have that early on to set up that he can throw a football. Yes. But when we're looking at it, it's even like how the entire situation is manufactured in a way. This this isn't a group of people who happen to be getting uh, waiting for a group of teenagers to just appear at this cabin at this exact moment. It, the entire situation is engineered from the fact that they had been prepping them all so that they ended up going to the fact that Chris Hemsworth's random cousin tells him, hey, I got this great property you should check out. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't even have, at the end of the movie, I love when he goes, he doesn't even have a cousin. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's so great because it just shows how meticulous everything was putting up to it. And then we have, like, the Harbinger, who's this over-the-top, you know, that creepy character who always gives them the directions to where they're going and is always in on it. And you're just like, he's so over-the-top. And yeah. the speakerphone scene so shouldn't good. be as funny as it is. But so it's funny. so funny. It's so funny. I love this speaker. Wait, am I still on speed? And they just start laughing. But again, that goes into Richard Jenkins and Bradley Whitford mm-hmm. just having so much fun with it and yep. just being like willing to just make fools of themselves and lean in so hard. I love it. I think I like they're they're so funny. A lot of just really good decisions in the movie, like that fake wall where we see the bird fly into it at first, and then mm-hmm. we know that when Chris Hemsworth's going to jump, he's gonna crash into it, or you've forgotten by that point. I love when they get in the elevator and they go down and it's like, well, it can't be worse than anything else. And now they're in these boxes when all the other creatures are kind of coming around them. That's such an interesting idea. Like mm-hmm. then you're like, well, are they even going to let them out of there? Are they going to be like, fine, they're in there, but no, they have to still kill the people and it has to be in the right order. So they can't just like keep them in there to starve because then the virgin yeah. could die before the fool. So you still need it to happen. Let's get them down here so we can figure it out. Like it's such a creepy moment. And almost like, Hey, yeah. Like we just have these prepackaged, nonsense villains that are going to come around and do stuff and it leads to just some like that girl with the weird face thing and mm-hmm. it's all just you know it's all creepy it just it it goes from like very funny to very creepy and still yeah. keeps it funny but it, it just becomes so much creepier as it goes on and like if that was a horror movie when they go into that elevator you'd be like holy crap this is scary yeah but it's also such a fantastic that sequence of the boxes and everything is so fun for people who are not fans of the horror genre because they can kind of look at the items in the basement and kind of like piece together which one Mm -hmm. relates to which item that they were seeing and everything. I mean, you get like what Fornicus, the Lord of Pain with his, uh, his puzzle box. Mm -hmm. And like, that's that, that's that trigger moment where it's like, Oh, we've actually seen that one. But Mm -hmm. being able to like look at all of those as a horror fan and just like pick out, every single horror reference yeah in that wall and like there are some like pretty crazy ones there was um the left left for dead zombies were in there which people might not even remember that game existed anymore at this Mm -hmm. point but it was supposed to to play in the movie theaters uh it was like the first person shooter right no that was that was house of the dead left for dead was 
Left 4 Dead was a four-player co-op game, and it was supposed to have like a crossover with um, with Cabin in the Woods, but the studio mm-hmm. went bankrupt, so it never came to fruition. But you kind of still see those zombies in there, and like those are those kind of neat Easter eggs that you can look for in this movie and see them and just understand what this movie's trying to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I like that they never let off. You know, like the whole time, I, I, meta movies don't work that often. A lot of times mm-hmm. a meta movie is too meta, it thinks it's too clever. This movie can't stop winking at you. And yet you're like, all right, keep winking at me. Keep winking at me. Like you feel like you're so in on the joke, but you never feel like you're being talked down to or something like it just, it feels like they just can't stop winking. So you just got to keep going along with it. Just keep letting them wink, keep letting them wink. And, and you're, you're in on it. You're having a lot of fun with it rather than just waiting for the next thing to, to take place or, you know, whatever. it's, it's very much, um, Normally a meta movie, it's like, okay, now you're just being like self-centered. Like now it's yeah. egotistical. Now you're pandering. Horror movies are so on the nose all the time. Mm-hmm. Like this is to me the better version of Scream. Like this is that right. – this is Scream done mm-hmm. even better because it's really, really – like Scream mm-hmm. doesn't lean into it hard enough in my yeah. estimation. This one just says – it's not going to just be somebody sitting at home watching a movie going, hey, no, there's somebody behind you when there's somebody behind him. It's going to be like, hey, you've seen this literally five million times. Here it comes again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, and winking. And this movie doesn't – this movie isn't just this pure comedy meta version of it either. It does still have these horror elements where it, it has some terrifying buildup. And mm-hmm. that's what I think it really does well. It has, like, the creepy photo into the, like, one-way mirror mm-hmm. and, like – that photo's terrifying. Oh, it's terrifying. And, like, even in that photo, you kind of get all these, like, references to different horror movies and stuff. And then, but what's even better is there's this building tension in some of these scenes. It's the lake scene, where they're in the lake, and Chris Hemsworth's mm-hmm. like, oh, what's that in the lake? You're like, oh, man, there's something in the lake. They're like, they're, something bad's going to happen. And then it's the, 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 the humor of him pushing his girlfriend into the lake. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. there's, like, the truth or dare scene, where... Uh, she starts making out with the wolf, which is an incredible scene. It is so funny what Anna Hutchinson does in that with that, mm-hmm. and just like how and she approaches that situation. To bite her in the face. You're, exactly, you're just waiting for it to bite her in the face because you're like something bad has to happen, and then it doesn't. And it's so that moment of just that relief of nothing happened to then mm-hmm. have it like shattered by the the cellar door opening. Mm-hmm, it, it, mm-hmm. It's, it's phenomenal. It, it's incredible filmmaking and it's, it, it's going to be hard to surpass cabin in the woods when it comes to a horror meta film anywhere in the future. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and, and we've already seen some horror meta films come out since then, which has only been a decade and they very rarely, you know, they're not even really close. I mean, it, it just mm-hmm. seems like a lot of times it just seems too much. Do we want to go more horror? Do we want to go more comedy? Are we talking at the audience too much rather than still watching? I think what works with the Kevin Woods, you're still watching this story unfold. Yes. If you're still watching really like a horror movie unfold. You're just watching it while the writer and director are winking at you. Whereas in Scream, you're not really watching a horror movie unfold. You're watching people wink at you. That's mm-hmm. I like there's a difference there. Yeah, exactly. And it's a, we're lucky that this actually got released because it was kind of just sitting on a shelf for a few years, uh, which is why Chris Hemsworth is not as jacked as he was in Thor. That came up the same. That came out mm-hmm. the year it was made, because he wasn't Thor yet when this movie was made. Yeah, so that that came out the same year though. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's also great living in BC and knowing I can go stay at the cabin in the woods. That's a DC. No, it's BC. It's where BC. I, I was like, I was like, you don't live in DC. What are you talking no, about? No, I live DC? in DC. Oh. I live in British. So they shot. Oh, okay, so it's up there. Yeah, in Vancouver. Uh, just outside of Vancouver. Okay. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's where everybody in Hollywood goes because it's cheaper to film. There. It's cheaper up here. <laughs> yeah. And now that I know this whole murder thing, maybe they go up there to kill people too, John. I mean, geez, God, it's like you get a whole, you know, like a whole like fifty <laughs> years less if you just go do it in Canada. That's crazy. I did not know that. Um. All right. 
we have anything else or are we wrapping this up and getting ready to move on to number 56 next week? No. Uh, let's um, just move on to number 56 next week. All right, number 56 next week. We're going James Bond. John has Goldfinger from 1964, and I have Sunset Boulevard. So we are going in a time machine here. Actually, for the next two weeks, we are in the uh, the 50s, 60s, 40s, and 70s over the course of the next two weeks. Um, so getting a little old school after a more modern episode this week. A couple, a couple modern episodes in a row. Um, yeah, we go Goldfinger and Sunset Boulevard, and the week after that is Fantasia and The Last Picture Show. So couple coming up here that should be pretty fun i gotta go podcast about survivor so that's also going to be fun the next to last episode probably back uh tuesday or thursday or something like that of next week we haven't quite figured out the exact date but it won't be wednesday because it's the survivor finale but we'll figure it out at some point so keep tuned for that look forward to doing it john always a pleasure get some 2020 20 2021 movies in so that we yes. can talk about so we can do our end of the year fun um, coming up not too long from now. Absolutely. All right. See you later, everybody.